Pirates of the Caribbean, The Haunted Mansion, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, it's a small world. If you're familiar with Disney theme parks, these names no doubt conjure up images of travelling through a dimly lit tunnel on a small boat or cart as animatronic characters sing and dance around you. Some of these songs might even be stuck in your head right now, in which case, you're very, very welcome. Dark rides, also known as ghost trains, have been part of the Disney theme parks brand since Disneyland first opened in 1955, becoming ever more elaborate and technologically advanced over the years. Yet, no matter how sophisticated these attractions got, few can rival the sheer audacity and spectacle of a dark ride that thrilled and inspired viewers all the way back in 1939. Known as the Futurama, this wonder of engineering and showmanship used the very latest in 1930s technology to present fairgoers with a spectacle modern dark rides could only dream of. A stunningly accurate vision of America 20 years in the future. In the 1930s, dark rides were nothing new, the first such attractions, known as Old Bills, having appeared in the late 1800s. Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, the American countryside was dotted with thousands of flour and sawmills built near rivers and streams to make use of the abundant water power, while canals were the main means of transporting goods over long distances. The development of the steam engine and the railroads, however, rendered much of this infrastructure obsolete, and many mills and canals and the towns that grew up around them were shuttered, abandoned, and left to rot. Over time, these abandoned ruins gained a reputation for being haunted, providing perfect fodder for inventors of early amusement park rides. The very first dark ride, dubbed the Old Mill, was built in 1895 by entrepreneur Paul Boyton at Coney Island's Sea Lion Park. Small boats carried guests two at a time down a narrow canal, which twisted its way through a labyrinth of artificial caverns decorated with fairies, gnomes, and other fantasy creatures. Later versions leaned more on the haunted reputation of Old Mills by incorporating spooky supernatural elements or injected brief thrills by having the boat plummet down a chute at the end. Though tamed by today's standards, Old Mill rides and their descendants, like the ubiquitous Tunnel of Love, proved extremely popular, though less for their actual content than the opportunity they provided to flout social taboos. In an era when any public display of affection, even holding hands between unmarried people, was frowned upon, Old Mill rides provided a socially acceptable excuse for couples to hold each other close in a dark and private space. So yes, we owe the modern theme park industry to a bunch of horny teenagers and young adults. What a surprise. For this reason, such rides remained popular well until the 20th century, with the oldest continuously operating dark ride in the US, the Old Mill at Kennywood Park in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, opening in 1901. However, as social taboos began loosening in the 1920s, Old Mill rides became less popular with adults, and most were redesigned to appeal to children. From these humble beginnings, dark rides grew swiftly in scale and sophistication. In 1901, American architect and showman Frederick Thompson built an attraction called A Trip to the Moon for the Pan American an exposition in Buffalo, New York. Based on Jules Verne's 1865 novel From the Earth to the Moon, the elaborate ride, housed in a 40,000 square foot building costing a then eye-watering $84,000, took its guests on an imaginary voyage to the moon aboard a bat-winged airship called the Luna. After paying a then princely half dollar, $16 in today's money for the experience, guests climbed a gangplank from the luxuriously appointed waiting room to the airship's equally lush gondola. The airship's wings then began to beat a gust of wind blew through the room, and the scenery of the surrounding fairgrounds painted on movable canvases began to fall away, producing a remarkably convincing illusion of soaring into space. The scenery gave way to a miniature dire armor of the city of Buffalo, lit with hundreds of electric light bulbs, while the moon overhead grew larger and larger. After passing through a simulated cloud and rainstorm, the airship, traveling on suspended cables, finally entered a star-filled outer space and sailed towards the moon. There it flew through elaborate papier-mâché canyons and caverns populated by beautiful moon maidens and gnome-like selenites, played by a cast of 200 costumed actors, including 60 little people. Finally, the airship returned to Earth, where after climbing down a rope ladder, guests exited the attraction through, well, what else other than a gift shop? A Trip to the Moon, the world's first automatic, electrically powered dark ride and one of the first space-themed amusement park attractions, was a smash hit, attracting nearly half a million visitors over the run of the exposition. After the fair closed, the ride was purchased by George Tillieu, owner of Coney Island Steeplechase Park, who turned it into the centerpiece of his newly built Luna Park. Once again, the ride proved extremely popular, with nearly a million visitors experiencing the fanciful voyage before Luna Park was destroyed by a fire in 1944. Another surprisingly sophisticated early dark ride was Hale's Tours and Scenes of the World, built by Kansas City Fire Chief George Hale for the 1904 St. Louis Exhibition. Incorporating the then-new technology of cinema, Hale's attraction consisted of a Pullman train car surrounded 
surrounded by movie screens, onto which projected scenes from a travelogue film. The scenes were shot and projected from the perspective of the front, back, and sides of a train, creating the immersive experience of riding the rails through beautiful vistas such as the Swiss Alps. The illusion was further enhanced by motors that shook and tilted the rail car as it went around corners, piped in audio effects like the rumble of the locomotive and train whistles, and even simulated wind and rain effects. Hale's tours proved so popular that Adolf Zukor, a New York entrepreneur, purchased the rides to set up his own version in Union Square. While the novelty of the ride eventually wore off, the success of the attraction convinced Zukor of the commercial viability of cinema, prompting him to open one of New York's first movie theaters. Zukor later became one of the three founders of Paramount Pictures and produced one of the first American feature-length films, 1913's The Prisoner of Zender. Thus, Hale's innovation not only laid the groundwork for modern multimedia dark rides, but also indirectly gave us the movie industry we know and love today. Less elaborate but equally influential was the amusement railway patented in 1928 by American showmen and inventors Marvin Rempfer and Leon Cassidy. The pair originally wanted to build a traditional old mill ride, but finding the cost prohibitive, instead conceived a new track-based system using an old Dodge car to build their first prototype. While rail-based dark rides had existed before, Rempfer and Cassidy's system was the first to use a single rail and to make the entire ride electrically powered and fully automated. The system's three-wheel carriages were guided and driven by the single swiveling front wheel, which rode on an electrified rail and provided power to the carriage's motor. This arrangement permitted the carriage to easily negotiate tight turns and added to the thrill of the rides by allowing the rear wheels to swerve and skid unpredictably. In 1929, Remper and Cassidy built their first horror-themed amusement railway ride at Tumbling Dam Park in Bridgeton, New Jersey, featuring a looping track that meandered its way past a variety of jump scares like snapping papier-mâché alligators, dancing skeletons, or vampires rising from coffins, each automatically triggered by switches on the track as the carriage rolled past. The circuitous track layouts led to the rides being nicknamed Pretzels, and Remfer and Cassidy soon renamed their company the Pretzel Amusement Ride Company. Over the following two decades, the Pretzel Company built thousands of track-based dark rides across North America, as well as the UK, France, South Africa, and Australia. In addition to permanent installations for amusement parks, the company also produced portable pretzel rides for county fairs that could be quickly dismantled and transported place to place with a convoy of flat bed trucks. So robust and reliable were these rides that an example built at Blackpool Amusement Beach in England in 1929 is still operating to this day, the oldest ride of its kind in the world. Thus, by the late 1920s, most of the technologies underpinning modern dark rides had already been developed. But it would not be until the following decade that dark rides would attain their ultimate potential to amaze and inspire. Enter the Futurama. The Futurama was the General Motors Corporation's main exhibit at the 1939 New York World's Fair. Originally conceived to celebrate the 150 50th anniversary of President George Washington's inauguration in 1789, the fair soon grew into a massive cultural event designed to draw tourist dollars into New York City and help lift the spirits of the city and country, which was still marred in the depths of the Great Depression. New York City Parks Commissioner Robert Moses also saw in the fair a golden opportunity to reclaim and redevelop an infamous New York eyesore, the massive stinking ash and garbage dump in Queens known as Flushing Meadows. According to Moses' plan, after the fair closed, the fairgrounds and the profits from the fair itself would be used to create a sprawling park for the benefit of the citizens of New York. The chosen name of the fair was Building the World of Tomorrow, a gleaming showcase of the wonders of modern science and technology and how it would guide the world into a brighter future. To this end, the fair's organizers brought in scientific luminaries like Albert Einstein and Harold Array to consult on the fair's exhibits. But it was not to be. Though fair president Grover Whelan managed to convince a number of countries, including the UK, Italy and the Soviet Union to build pavilions at the fair, many nations could not afford the extravagant cost, meaning that the majority of the fair's exhibits were provided by the only entities that could, major American corporations. Thus, much to the irritation of scientists and other idealistic commentators, the fair ultimately evolved into a glorified trade show with corporations like Ford, General Motors, Westinghouse, RCA, General Electric, and others using elaborate high-tech gadgetry and showmanship to show off their latest consumer products. Yet, despite Despite their decidedly commercial nature, these exhibits nonetheless proved every bit as awe-inspiring as the fair's organizers had hoped. RCA, for instance, showcased the very first practical consumer televisions and Bell Labs, a digital voice synthesizer called the Voda, while the Westinghouse Pavilion featured a machine that generated giant lightning bolts, a primitive computer game called the Nimitron, a humanoid robot named Electro who walked, spoke, and responded to voice commands, and even smoked cigarettes, and one of the world's first time capsules filled with everyday objects and designed to be buried under the fairgrounds for 5,000 years. 
But even these technological wonders paled in comparison to the future armor. For while other companies' exhibits merely hinted at a brighter, technology-driven future, GM's entry actually presented fairgoers with a living, breathing, full-color vision of the world of tomorrow. It was, unsurprisingly, a future built entirely around the automobile. The future armor, officially known as Highways and Horizons, was designed by famous industrial designer Norman Bell Geddes to showcase how the traffic problems of the future might be addressed. At the time, the road network outside major American cities was a patchwork mess of dirt roads and narrow paved highways, and as the automobile became an ever greater fixture of American life, the nation faced a gridlock problem on an unprecedented scale. To head off this problem, Geddes came up with a radical new transportation system incorporating multi lane superhighways, automatic interchanges, double decker freeways, and elevated pedestrian walkways. Geddes estimated that such a system could easily be built in as little as 20 years and designed the future armor to give fair go as a bird's eye view of America in the not too distant year of 1960. Housed in a striking, gleaming white 3,200 square meter building, every detail of Getty's attraction was meticulously designed to inspire awe and complete immersion. Visitors entered the Futurama through a tall, narrow cleft in the building's stark white facade, flanked by the giant letters GM. Down a long staircase, they descended into a dimly lit 60 foot tall chamber where a 60 by 100 foot map of the United States floated into view. As lights represented, Presenting major cities, waterways, and roads blinked on across the map, a pre-recorded voice explained the problems of traffic congestion, plague in America, and how modern measures such as the construction of a high-speed automated freeway system would alleviate these ills. Then the visitors stepped two by two onto a series of 552 lushly upholstered wing seats mounted on a track which whisked them away into the attraction proper. The ride, which Geddes likened to a magic carpet, was designed to give the illusion of sitting in an aircraft flying low over the future American landscape. This is accompanied by a massive 3,000 square meter diorama, which included more than 500,000 individually designed buildings, 1 million trees, and 50,000 cars, 10,000 of which were animated to drive continuously along tiny 14 lane superhighways. Based on actual aerial photography of the American countryside, Geddes's utopian vision was phenomenally detailed, featuring modern automated farms, glass domed orchards, helipads for personal auto gyros, futuristic cars that automatically kept their distance using radio beams flying aircraft, rivers and waterfalls, low-flying clouds, factories, amusement parks, and even country clubs. But one element, as visitors were quick to point out, was conspicuously missing. Churches, and oversight Geddes, was quick to correct. And as the visitors soared along at 120 feet per minute, the voice of Edgar Barrier of Orson Welles' Mercury Theatre floated through speakers built into the upholstery. Now we have arrived in the wonder world of 1960. Sunshine, trees, farm hills and valleys, flowers and flowing streams. The world of tomorrow is a thing of beauty. The man has forged ahead since 1939. New and better things have sprung from his industry and genius. Here we see one of our 1960 Express motorways. Directly ahead is a modern experimental farm and dairy. Note the terraced fields and strip planting. The fruit trees bear abundantly under individual glass housings. Strange? Fantastic? Unbelievable? Remember, this is the world of 1960. Though commonplace in dark rides today, the Futurama's sound system was a technological marvel for its day. Known as Polyrashor, the device consisted of a 20-ton rotating drum, 8 feet in diameter, electronically synchronized to the motion of the track. The 14-minute soundtrack was divided into 22 segments of 39 seconds each, each segment being recorded on the audio track of a piece of cinema film wrapped around the drum. As the drum rotated, each loop of film was carried past a set of optical scanners, the output of which was wired to one of 22 separate sections of the track. As each a pair of chairs reached a particular section of the track, a set of electrical pickups wired to the built-in speakers would connect to the appropriate segment of soundtrack for that part of the diorama. This, along with soundproofing to prevent noise interference between seats, allowed visitors to hear a continuous narration synchronized to the view outside, regardless of variations in the track speed. But this wasn't the Futurama's only trick. Through continuous changes in the diorama's scale and strategically placed rises and falls in the track, Geddes created the illusion of flying at different altitudes. As the ride neared its end, the buildings of a looming metropolis grew larger and larger until the visitors found themselves floating over a four-cornered urban intersection featuring an apartment block, a grocery store, and a GM dealer. Leadership. Suddenly, the chairs emerged into a full-size reproduction of that same intersection, producing an effect many visitors likened to being shrunk down and placed inside the diorama. Climbing down from their seats, the visitors were free to wander about this intersection of tomorrow and peruse GM's latest automotive products, including the striking Pontiac ghost car with a body made entirely of transparent plexiglass. On their way out of the exhibit, visitors were handed a blue and white pin bearing the words, I have seen the future. 
The Futurama was by far the most popular and well-regarded attraction of the fair, with 47.5% of respondents listing it as the exhibit they would most like to visit again, compared to 7.3% for distant second-place winner General Electric. The ride operated at its maximum capacity of 30,000 people nearly every day of the fair, with more than 10 million people experiencing GM's vision of the future. The ride was so influential and well-remembered that 25 years later, an updated version was built by GM for the 1964 New York World's Fair. Yet for all its immersive, high-tech, visual wizardry and deft combination of showmanship and corporate promotion, perhaps the most remarkable aspect of the Futurama is how mundane and attainable its vision of the future was. While its 1964 successor promised underwater cities and vacation resorts on the moon, the main technology promoted by the original Futurama, high-speed, multi-lane, controlled-access highways for reducing traffic congestion, was perfectly feasible in the 1930s. They only required sufficient funding and political will. Indeed, in 1944, Geddes was invited by President Franklin D. Roosevelt to consult on the Federal Aid Highway Act, which laid the groundwork for the later interstate highway system, a project which ultimately realized Geddes' vision. Unusually for a futurist, Geddes actually underestimated the post-war growth in automobile usage in America. While he predicted that in 20 years, Americans would own 38 million cars, in actuality, by 1960, there were more than 74 million million cars on the road. The Futurama was the ultimate synthesis of more than 50 years of dark ride development, leveraging the very latest in technology and a phenomenal amount of creativity, talent, and showmanship to create a fully immersive, surprisingly accurate glimpse into the future, one that stuck with those who experienced it for the rest of their lives. So the next time you're riding It's a Small World for the third time in a row, take a moment to consider what modern theme park ride can claim the same.